and gentlemen, for those able to, could I ask you to stand, please?
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats. Boridabau Bakroiso, good morning to you all and welcome. We hear with heavy but warm hearts as we remember the life of Rodri Morgan, who died so suddenly and unexpectedly on the 17th of May. Even though we are sad that Rodri is no longer a visible part of our lives, he will always remain in our hearts and in our memories. His family very much want this to be a real celebration of his life, and we'll do that with words, poetry, music, and memories from his family and friends. Rodri wouldn't want any heavy mourning or hand-wringing today. He had a very pragmatic attitude to life and to death. I feel privileged to have known Rodri throughout his time as an MP and as an AM, which of course included his 10 years as First Minister here in the Senate, where we felt today was just the right place to be. He was very much the people's First Minister, and today's ceremony is very much a people's ceremony, a ceremony for Rodri. Mind you, he wouldn't have wanted the police escort. Um, he always refused such trappings of state, but you know, Rodri sometimes needs must. Some people may have been surprised when they learned that Rodri's funeral was to be a non-religious one led by a human, humanist celebrant. I am human too. <laughs> well, Rodri was a patron of Humanists UK, previously known as the British Humanist Association, and Julie is also a patron. Humanists believe that this is the one life we have and that we should make it a good and meaningful life. We believe we can live ethical and fulfilling lives on the basis of reason and humanity. And we trust the scientific method, evidence and reason to discover truths about the universe. We also place human welfare and happiness at the centre of our ethical decision-making. It's not about being anti-religion, though. I always say there's room for all of us in this world, as long as there is respect for each other's beliefs, and as long as those beliefs do not impinge negatively on others. Rodri lived his life as a humanist, but he also engaged with all the faith communities and those from different cultures. And that was during the course of his personal life, but also his political life. There are people here today from Humanists UK, from all the faith communities that Rodri worked with and supported, and people from almost every strand of public life. And each one of you, I'm sure, has a story to tell about Rodri. But more importantly, there are members of the, the public here who have just come along because they may have met Rodri once, and when people met him once, they never forgot him, and they counted him as a friend. We couldn't get everyone in, but as I said earlier, Julie and her family just felt this was the right place to be today, and they are so grateful and touched that every one of you made the journey here today. The whole of Wales and beyond has been shocked and saddened at Rodri's death. But however sad we may be, it cannot compare to the grief and the shock felt by his family. He and Julie were soulmates for 53 years, having met in 1964 during an election campaign and they celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary just recently. I know that Rodri was loved and very much treasured by his children, Mary, Stuart, and Shani, and their partners. He was adored by the grandchildren, Tanisha, Johan, Yastin, Reuben, Evan, Irie, Stefan, and Jaden. And he was known variously to you as Dadki, Grandad, Bumpy, or Rod. He was admired and very much loved by his brother Priest 
And I would also like to mention Julie's close cousin, Margaret. There are many other family members and so many friends who were all part of Rodri's life. And I think it's testament to how much he was revered and respected by the numbers of people here today and the number of tributes that have filled column inches, if not yards or metres, um, in the newspapers and across the internet. Descriptions of him, such as an intellectual giant, have been repeated by many people who knew him and by those who didn't really know him but felt they did because, as I said, they met him once and that one meeting would have had a huge impact on them. Others have said, Rodri was a gold mine of information whose curiosity was boundless. He knew everything about everything, and those of us who have sat down with him, sometimes, you know, your eyes would, because he just knew everything, and he remembered everything. The thing that will always stay with me about Rodri was his determination to maintain a healthy work-life balance. Many of us here have been in usually evening meetings with Rodri where he'd say, I'll have to go in a minute to pick up Julie from the station, or I've got to go now because I'm babysitting. And so many have said to me how they would see him in the mornings taking the grandchildren to school, buying his fruit and veg at Riverside Farmer's Market with his famous plastic bag in his hand, just Rodri, down to earth as ever. Well, there's a lot more that we'll be hearing about Rodri in a moment, but for now, we're going to sing Callan Lan. The words are on the order of service, but we have a special edition of Callan Lan. Rodri's grandson, Evan, is going to sing, unaccompanied, the first verse and the chorus. We will sit and listen to him, and then I will ask you to stand, and we will sing the whole of the hymn from the beginning. So I'd like to invite Evan to come forward and to sing the first verse and the chorus. Thank you. 
So very well done, Evan. You take your seat with your family now. You can be very proud of yourself. And I know Rodri would be so proud of you too. Well, members of Rodri's family will now pay their tributes to him. And first of all, um, Priest Morgan is going to share some memories of his younger brother. Uh, well, a chydig iawn o atgofion personol sy geni, fel brawd. Uh, just a few uh, memories of Rodri as a, a brother, just a few fraternal memories, and that by way of saying thank you to Rodri for nearly 80 years of company. Diolch am dy gwmni, Rodri. Diolch am fawr iawn am agos i bedwar i genblynedd o gwmpni. Ond o the dechrau adau, pan gwrnes i a Rodri gyntaf, ddim yn hapus iawn, ddim yn ffafriol iawn, pan ddath y babi nôl o Conot Road i'r tŷ, mi ddwedes i wrth yn hard am am, tulwch y babi dros y wal i'r capel Wesle. Dwi'n ddim yn gallu siarad, beth yw'r ewst, dwi'n ddau ddim. When, he, when the baby Rodri came back, from Connaught Road, from the nursing home, uh, the welcome was not very warm from me. I said to my father and mother, chuck him over the, the, the garden wall into the Wesley Chapel. He can't speak. What's the good of a baby who can't speak? Uh, than hard or thoi now. The wife di iw roi gwersi rodri i ddysgive i siarad. Ac o'n i'n gweld pethau'n wahanol wedi ni, a dwi'n meddwl y byddech chi gyd yn cytuno bod y nisgybl cyntau o the nisgybl mwya disglair, fel siaradwr. Uh, I, my father leant to, over me and said, your job, the job that we've got for you is to teach him to speak. And I think all of you here would agree he was not only my first pupil, but also my most brilliant pupil <laughs> at being taught to speak. Uh, and uh, he, uh, I do remember then, my father was very interested in child-centered education and children's rights, even in the 1940s. hard, and we done the Ashan Amateur Contemporary of Rodri, and they go on here in Igerded, Rio Bester. We have a lot of people who are Rodri and Doi, and we have a lot at a crosshell, see the Hanol Radi, a Windsor Road, a Midlan, at a, a club golf, a Canablan, and of dim traffic are for that. Ma, and Hard and Roy Rodri are Ganol, a Grois for that. Now, we're teasing off a Dewish pa for the team money dealing. And we're teasing off a Pendavani. Uh, my father took Rodri out when, I, when he was about two uh, on his first long walk. And, uh, we, uh, and I was about four, and we were on the crossroads in the middle of Radda with Windsor Road leading up to the golf, golf uh, course, golf uh, club. And uh, my father said to Rodri, now you've got to decide where you want to walk. Teasing off a pendavini. Ag, uh, ag vomit hon odath Mrs. Warren yn cymdogus ni, a doedd hi ddim yn credu mewn hawlio plant o gwbl. What's going on here, Adam? And hard to wait. I'm, I'm trying to get. Wait, Dada must have a will too, but I want him to develop his will. Me then hard. I get him getting well. Oh, vanna, my horse and yade Rodrin Dord or Gal Adisk see then and canoli are a plant. Ag o Gal Haulie plant. I get him with the plugod Rodri a wishes. Ag o ddeng gallu yn yn teulu ni o ddeng gallu dy datblygu bersonoliaeth yn gynnar iawn. In our family, because of this belief in Rodri having to develop his own will, he was able to develop his personality very young. But he showed his personality, first of all, by wanting to become a comedian. That is what he wanted, a stand-up. A peth cyntaf oedd Rodri mwyn bod oedd stand-up. Ac felly oedd rhaid i ni gyd gasglu jokes. Dyna peth penna o'n i wneud yn blentyn oedd casglu jokes. Mae, we wedi bod yn casglu jokes i Rodri byth oedd iar hynny. Ac uh, oedd Rodri'n dweud, uh, ac oedd Rodri'n anfon y jokes, mae at y bino ar dandy er mwyn ennill arian pocket. Uh, Rodri would send these jokes that I supplied him to the bino and the dandy so that he could earn a little extra pocket money. Ac oedd Rodri bob amser yn dweud mae'r bod yn brentis comedian oedd yr help mwyaf iddo fe i fod yn brif wenidog Cymru yn yr adeilad hwn. 
to know. Uh, Rodri always said that the greatest apprenticeship he could ever have had uh, was being, uh, by being uh, an apprentice uh, comedian was the best training he ever had for being Prime Minister of Wales. And, uh, he, but the, his interest was also uh, allowed to develop in politics. My father wasn't at all interested in politics. He always felt that he could uh, argue endlessly about politics on the, on the, uh, uh, at the fireside of the, of the house. And he also would drag us to political meetings when he was very, very very young, and I, I, everybody knows about the famous uh, tearful meeting, the, the, uh, the complete um, uh, chaos that there was when Dorothy Rees uh, tried to be acceptable to the Tories of Radha uh, in 1951, when she became Labour MP for, for Barry, and Rodri was infuriated at the chaos of the meeting that had to be quietened by the appearance of uh, a, a politician from Flintshire, uh, Lord MacDonald of Gwynescor, the, the, the last governor of Newfoundland. He was the only one who could restore peace to uh, the village hall of Radia. <laughs> and uh, Sharad uh, a fyth o lwde yn aelod seneddol yn mi'n naw pimp un o'r oedd yn trio cael ei ail uh, ethol yn mi'n naw pimp pimp a rhodri'n bymtheg oed ac ar ôl i Raymond gawr orffen Sharad dyma rhodri'n codi yr unig gwestiwn dyma rhodri'n codi a gofyn pa un o gyfansoddiadau yn is Cypris y mae'r ymgeisydd Turiedd o blaid o blaid uh, cyfansoddiad a Cyfansoddiad B, neu cyfansoddiad Ec. Uh, when Raymond Gower was presenting himself to be uh, a, a Conservative MP in 1955, he dragged, Rodri dragged us to the meeting in Radha, and the, the, Raymond Gower gave a speech, and then at the end there was complete silence, and Rodri got up as a little boy and said, which of the three constitutions of Cyprus is the candidate in favor of? Is it Constitution A, Constitution B, or Constitution C? And there was total silence. Raymond Gower had never heard of the constitutions of Cyprus, and neither, fortunately, neither had anybody except Rodri in the whole hall. Uh, that he, there was complete silence and total consternation. But it was. A, uh, but I often think. We have a Rodri and Dweid of Neb and Voy Caredig, Blundoth, Wedi Egan Maneth, and the Wedarach of Rodri with him in the T, T. Cafredin. And Pangreza of Rodri T. Cafredin of Neb and Voy Caredig, Nar Elod Sinedo Rosabari, Sir Raymond Gower, or then Moya Hovrid, a Tubid Auden Kovior Bachkenbach, a Godoth, Iovin a question of Nuigen Nedkini. I like to think that when Rodri went in 1987 to the House, uh, no one was more welcoming to him than Sir Raymond Gower. He was wonderful to Rodri right at the beginning, and I like to think that somehow or other in his memory, he had a, a memory of this little boy, this awkward little boy who'd got up to ask him about the insoluble constitutions of, of Cyprus. Ond fe aeth blynyddoedd heibio cyn bo Rodri'n penderfynu mynd i'r Senedd. A mi o fynnes i i Rodri, pan o'n i'n aros gyda Julia Rodri, dros nadolig dweitha, mi o fynnes i Rodri pryd yn union o ti wedi penderfynu mynd i'r ti, mynd yn wleidydd, mynd yn wleidydd seneddol. Uh, I asked Rodri last Christmas when I was staying with Julie and Rodri, when exactly did you uh, decide to become an MP? Uh, and uh, he said, well, I can remember precisely the moment, he said. In 1974, when you were in the and I was in the middle of the or Alban. How about he were for the Rodri said he could remember precisely the moment uh, when he had decided to become an MP, and it was in 1974, uh, and it came from a very unexpected source. An aged, crusty Scottish Tory had made him become an MP. 
uh, and I said, how is that? On he goes into the city of the new city, go there, go there, and wait upon pan benotu regenta and suidog continuo de morganug. Me now south pedward of the ride de morganug gal death of brave it. Well, he mindir t and sinde na govin am death of brave it. He had to go as the planning officer, the new planning officer for the new county of South Glamorgan, to have a private bill passed, and therefore he had to go up to Westminster to uh, present his evidence to a committee of the two houses, of the Commons and the Lords. I was Roger Wilgo for Troy, he just your left get on a tear of reading, are our glue the other question a gore with the Cali Govin gan he and Dory or Alban or any Lords Cathcart, Earl Cathcart, or the Beneath a Queen's bodyguard for Scotland. I got Roger and Tim, but a question a gun at he and Urma and Sauer Moy Dovin, I know the hat tab. Ar ddiwedd yr uh, y sesiwn dyma nhw gyd yn codi, a pan aethon nhw allan, dyma Earl Cathcart yn pwyso ymlaen at Rodri ac yn sibrwd mewn i'w gliste, damn good show, my boy. I've never seen a better show, marvellous performance, you'll go far, my boy. Ac dyna, ar ddiwedd y rhoi'r dystioleth, oedd rhaid i bawb, everyone had to get up at the end of the evidence giving, and as the Lords and the Commons went out of the committee, Lord Cathcart lent quietly to Rodri and whispered in his ear, Damn good show, my boy. Marvellous performance. I've never seen a better one. You'll go far, my boy. I goes, and Rodri said to me that that was the moment, if I can have praise from such an unexpected source as a crusty old Scottish Tory earl, then I'm clearly in the wrong profession and I should be there, not here. I should be in the Parliament, inside Westminster, not outside it. But he said also that... It took a long time, of course, between, uh, between uh, that decision, 1974 and 1987, when he was elected. Dwi'n cofio mynd lan pan oedd Rodri'n gofyn i gwestiwn cynta yn Westminster. Cyn iddo fe roi i'r maiden speech, ac oedd mam a fe newid i gorffwyr mynd lan i glywed yn gofyn y cwestiwn. Uh, we had to go up to Westminster in 87, because Rodri was asking a question before he gave his maiden speech, and he wanted my mother and me to come up and hear him. And he was very nervous, so then nervous iawn cyn cyn siarad yn anarferol yn nervus. A mi wedi sydd yfe nawr disgwyl ma Rodri oedd dy hen dad ci Thomas Rhys Blaen Rolchfa wedi cael ei glodfori gan Thomas Ellis Cynlas. Ti i Ellis ond brif chwip i Mr Gladstone. Ac oedd Tom Ellis Cynlas yn dweud mae Thomas Rhys yn hen dad ci oedd y siaradwr gore ar bleidyddiaeth ti fas i Westminster, ti fas i San Stefan. Uh, I said to Rodri, now look, don't be nervous because Tom Ellis, Mr Gladstone's chief whip, Tom Ellis of Cynlas near Bala, uh, said to our great-grandfather Thomas Rhys of Blind Rolfa that he was Thomas Rees was the finest political speaker he had heard outside Westminster. Now, surely, Rodri, with all your education in, West, in, in Oxford and Harvard, you can do better than Thomas Rees of Blind Rolfa. And he, he, he shrugged his shoulders, he, he straightened his shoulders he, and walked into the, to the chamber and asked his question and gave us a big wink when he sat down. But it took a long time then before he became the father of the of the Cynulliad, uh, the father of the Assembly, oedd cryn amser wedi mynd heibio. Ac eto, mi'n cofio dweud wrth Rodri pan sefydlwd y lle yma yn mi naw, naw, uh, naw. Mi'n cofio dweud wrth Rodri a oedd e'n cofio mynd yn blentyn lle oedd yna gysylltiad arall gyda Cymru Fydd a'r mudiad coll hwnnw, mudiad ofer hwnnw yn yr wyth nawdeg uh, y ganrif cyndwetha. Uh, a wedi sefydlu gan Tom Ellis a phobl eraill, ond i wedi cael yn gwahodd yn blant, yn ni oedd yr unig blant, yn unig bobl i gael yn gwaodd draw i benarth fanna i Barty Pemblwydd Elfed yn 90 oed, ac oedd Elfed wedi bod yn sgrifennydd y cyfarfod trychu nebus yn hasnewydd y 1896 lle'r aeth y mudiad Cymru Fydd i'r gwellt. We were invited in 1950, the only guests, over to Penarth, over there, to the 
party, the 90th birthday party of the Reverend H. L. Elvet Lewis, who had been the secretary of the, uh, the disastrous Cymru Vydd uh, uh, meeting in Newport in 1896 when the, the whole first devolution movement had absolutely uh, gone fut in 1896. And we were invited and Rodri said to Elvet, Elvet, Os da chi ddim bechyn o'ch oedran eich hunan a gallwch chi wawdd i'r parti, pam eich chi wedi gwawdd doi fach gen i fanc? Elfyd, haven't you got any boys of your own age that you could invite to your birthday party instead of inviting two, two youngsters like ourselves? A god Elfyd wedi troi at Rodri a dweud y mach gen i wi wedi eich dewis chi o bwrpas am reswm arbennig iawn. Wi am i rwyn yng nghofioi yn yr unfed ganrif ar higen. My boy, Elved said to Rodri, I have chosen you for a very special reason. I want somebody to remember me in the 21st century. Well, now I am doing that by mere lip service, but Rodri went much further than myself and served and honored the memory of Tom Ellis, honored the memory of Elvet. Surely you would all agree by establishing, helping to establish this place where we're all now standing. Surely he has honored uh, the memory of Elvet uh, in a most wonderful way. I finish, you'll be glad to hear, I'm finishing by a, a very short uh, text message which Julie had uh, a couple of days ago. That's my, that's my, uh, that's why I, I finish with this text message from uh, a remarkable scientist called Parviz Harris, professor in the De Montfort University in Leicester. Uh, and I throw, uh, Parviz Harris in Athro and De Montfort, previous called De Montfort, and, and Carlier. Uh, 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 Rodri, uh, uh, was opening a conference. According to this text message, Rodri opened the conference in a most remarkable way because I think really Rodri didn't write poetry, but the poetry came out in his speeches. And he opened this conference in 2005 by, it was a conference about spectroscopy in Cardiff. And he opened it by saying, when a farmer sees a rainbow, he sees rain. And when a scientist looks at a rainbow, he sees spectroscopy. And nobody knows where this marvelous phrase comes from. I presume it comes from, from Rodri. And it has gone all around the world for, as a seminar subject, as a discussion subject for scientists all around the world who respect that wonderful gift that Rodri had for putting poetry uh, in the most unexpected places. And I think that we all see different kinds of rainbows, and Rodri certainly did. He saw a rainbow society, and Rodri, of course, was uh, like the rest of us, always looking for a, a crock of gold at the end of the rainbow. And there, there is a crock of gold still to come from Rodri because uh, his autobiography will, is in the press and it will soon be published. His autobiography will soon be published and there will be many extraordinary stories in that, I can assure you. Uh, and the other crock of gold that is to come is a film that he made just before he died uh, about our great uncle Morgan Watkin who was a spy and Lloyd George's contact and link with Lenin, uh, Lenin, the great uh, leader, and uh, that will come. And of course, uh, you would all agree that the ultimate crock of gold that Rodri was really interested in uh, was at the end of the rainbow here uh, in this very building. Surely it's the chance that you have, we have, all of us here, to establish here in this very place a wonderful, radical Welsh democracy that will be an example to all the peoples of the world. World. Uh, van hyn mar crochan air ar ben drawer envis, y cyfle van hyn, dwi'n siŵr byddai e Rodri'n Cytuno, i sefydlu democratiaeth radicalaidd Gymreig a fydd yn y siampl ac yn ole i holl genhedloedd y byd. Diolch yn fawr. Thank you, Priest. Um, I was thinking as I was listening to you, uh, I would love to have been in the same room as you and Rodri, or to have had the two of you standing here debating something. It would have been fascinating. Thank you so much for that wonderful insight. 
um, into your life with your brother. Well, grandson Stefan and Johan are now going to uh, read a poem, a Welsh poem that Stefan has written, and we'll have uh, the English and Welsh versions, I think. If you'd like to come forward, thank you. Uh, this is a poem that I wrote in school last year and I won an award for it and Rod loved it very, very much. And he nearly knew all of the lyrics, all of the words. And it did suit him because the, the base of the poem is about a book and Rod very much loved books, so, yeah. Do we them and Vodion? I'm going to me them long way. Do we love it, them and our warren, on my mind of ye and bash? Do we love it, them and dace? Them and pre, I'm on that and blanny had I. My we love it, an antreg, a sundot, you tiddle and I sound. Do we love it, you will love it, on all my lover die out. Obviously, the poem doesn't sound as good in English, but uh, <laughs> let's see how it goes. My book is not medicine, but it makes me feel better. My book is not an aeroplane, but it takes me far away. My book is not a cake, but it feeds me very well. My book is not cold, but it turns me to ice. My book is not a key, but it unlocks my feelings. My book is not soil, but it's good for planting seeds. My book is a gift, and there's a surprise on every page. My book is just a book, but my, it's a good one. Thank you, boys. Again, Rodri would be so proud of you. Well, Rodri was proud of his children, Marie, Shani and Stuart, and um, I think they're going to come forward now and, and say a few words. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and my sisters, my mum, Abraham. I'd like to just read out a poem that my boy wrote and my dad used to take to school. It starts off, My hero. My hero is my grandpa because he was the first minister of Wales. He stood for the elect local elections. My grandpa takes me to school nearly every day and he teaches me about his garden and our farm. My grandpa is married to my nan and she is called Julie Morgan and she is my hero as well. And I think I'd just like to repeat that to my sisters, to my mum. And to my dad. Good night. There have been so many lovely tributes to our father that it's difficult to know what we can add as a family to what has been said already. There was no public and private persona. What you saw in public was pretty much what you got at home. So we're just going to share some of our memories of him. Within the tributes that have been given, um, there's been some distinct themes. And one of them has been his encyclopedic knowledge. Um, he did know a lot about a lot of things. As Steph said, he loved books. He loved newspapers. We would always have about five on a Sunday, and if he couldn't get one of the ones he wanted, he would ring one of us up and ask us to bring it down from Cardiff. Anybody else would have just put up with only having four, but no, he had to have all the newspapers he wanted. He loved the radio. It was on constantly in our house, and oh, still is on constantly, always not quite on the right frequency, so there was a crackle and he was constantly switching back between news programmes and sports commentaries and then back again. Oh, hang on, it's the news. Oh, no, right, we'll hear the second half of such and such. And he loved talking to people. And when he asked people questions, whoever they might be, other politicians, journalists, industrial leaders, 
our friends from school or his grandchildren. He was genuinely interested in what they had to say. And he stored up that information for use at another time. And he was always glad to share his knowledge. Of course, within the family, we didn't always really appreciate this. There's been a number of times at the dinner table when you thought, oh God, somebody's mentioned the Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> we'll be here for hours. And we would try to employ some sort of diversionary technique to alert the subject so to something that we knew something about. And if Priest and uh, my father were at the dinner table, then, you know, there were a lot of uh, subjects we tried to avoid. Um, when we were growing up, we would drive back and forth from the caravan in a camper van that we called the Dormobile. And my father would always pick up hitchhikers. I think this was partially because he had hitchhiked around America when he was a student and he wanted to return the favour. But I think partially it was because he had a captive audience there because <laughs> we never listened to him. And it was an opportunity to share his knowledge about all his favourite places in Wales. I mean, quite what these unsuspecting German pack backpackers <laughs> made of this scruffy looking man with wild hair with a van full of kids, because it was never just us. They were always our friends and other family members. And he'd speak to them in German, and he almost certainly knew something about the region they were from. And he would give them a list of 45 must-sees in Wales in the two days that they were here. I mean, they probably just wanted to have a bit of a sleep between Port Albert and Bury Port. So we'll never know quite what they made of it. Another theme of his tributes has been um, his love of sport, and he loved to go running. Whenever we wanted to go anywhere, it always had to be fitted in around my father's run. And then after he had run, he would come into the kitchen and he'd be dripping with mud and sweat because he'd run for miles, and then he would ice his knees. So we'd have these ice cubes and he'd be sitting there with this pool of water gradually spreading out around the kitchen with us all hanging around in the corner desperate to go out. Um, and I know that he's always said that he didn't have any regrets and I think politically he certainly didn't, but I know he did have a regret in terms of sport in that he never broke three hours for a marathon. He did, his fastest time was three hours, one minute and nine seconds. And I think every time he walked past that picture on our wall that said 30109, that one minute and nine seconds just tortured him a little bit there. Um, we had an active childhood and we'd always be going out and about, particularly from our caravan in the summer. And when we were thinking about what stories we should say about him, both me and Shani thought about this story. So we would take our, car um, our bikes down to the caravan and go off on trips on them. And one weekend, he decided that the three of us um, with him would cycle to Pushteri Youth Hostel, which is near Strumblehead Lighthouse in Pembrokeshire. I think we were hoping to see seal pups on the beach there. Um, I looked up yesterday, because I hadn't, you don't really have any concept when you're a child about how far things are. So I had a look to see how far this cycle rides. So it was 25 miles from the caravan to Posteri Youth Hostel. And we got there five and we had a lovely day. The day after was a completely different story. It was the day of the fast net disaster in 1979. There was a force 10 gale and sheeting rain. And the, he had three primary school age children with him with two packamacks between us, <laughs> me in a wet denim skirt. And he had to get us back to the caravan. And we called in this pub in the Gwine Valley, the Dufferin Arms, and the, um, the landlady there, um, made us cocoa when we were sitting there like drowned rats. And my father always said afterwards that if he hadn't been Welsh speaking, she would have called the police. <laughs> <laughs> but I think compared to this, I think anything he had to do politically was so much easier than getting three wet children 25 miles on a bike in West Wales. You know, politics was no issue. And of course, he loved watching sport as well. 
I remember my mother saying once, you can't have a sensible conversation with Rodri during the Olympics. His mind is elsewhere. <laughs> and it was so true. He was obsessed with athletics. If it was a different time zone that the Olympics was taking place, he thought nothing of getting the three of us up in the middle of the night to watch the 100 metres final. We'd get out of bed, we'd go downstairs, we'd watch the final, maybe we'd watch it run again, then we'd get back up and go back up into bed. The whole thing took about one minute. <laughs> conventional appearance. Generally, conversations that I have had about my father go along the lines of, I saw your dad on the telly last night. He was wearing odd socks. <laughs> but actually, I think, compared to when we were growing up, his appearance when, his when he was first minister was a miracle. <laughs> I remember the, the absolute hilarity in our household when he was first um, going to stand to be an MP and he got sent on a candidate's workshop, part of which was grooming. <laughs> and the idea that my father could be groomed in part of a day was just <laughs> hilarious. He used to have this pair of jeans that he loved when we were growing up. And whenever a hole developed in the denim, he would cut out a patch from another piece of denim and he would stick it on with Bostic glue. <laughs> Eventually, there were so many glued on pa uh, patches that the jeans were completely hard and they could literally stand up by themselves. <laughs> so actually, you know, he did pretty well <laughs> um, later on. And then finally, of course, there's the politics. Others are much better than we are to judge his legacy and what he achieved. We're not objective. All I can say is that, you know, it was a lifelong passion, um, the politics. You know, maybe a calling, I suppose, rather than a career choice. He had other options, but when we were kids, our weekends were spent on protest marches. Uh, you know, a really good weekend was if we could fit in two marches <laughs> rather than one. And, you know, for children, it's great. You've got ch chanting, you've got sticks to hold, you've got banners to wave. It was a great childhood. And I really remember um, during elections being in the back of the car um, while he had the loud hailer on the top and we'd be driving down round Dennis Powys with him going on the loud hailer. And then if he got out to talk to someone, as you can imagine, that could happen. <laughs> When we got fed up, we would call him back in over the loud tailor. <laughs> and if we got really fed up because he wasn't coming, we would start saying rude words over the loud tailor. <laughs> I'm not sure it was a vote winner, but it was part of our childhood. And finally, I just wanted to say that, you know, maybe he was the father of devolution, I don't know, or the father of the nation. But what I do know is that first and foremost and always, he was our father and later their grandfather. And we're going to miss him hugely. Yeah, there's, there's not much more I wanted to add. Like um, we were saying, we were talking about there's so many stories from our childhood, um, some bizarre. Some. So um, one story, t you know, saying about his um, scruffiness, which I know I have followed in his, uh, <laughs> in his steps. Um, yeah, when uh, we were about eight or nine, Mary went over her friend's house in Dinis Powys and um, her friend gave her um, a Pippa doll. So if you don't remember them, they were very uh, skinny little dolls with very thick, shiny hair, long hair. And um, so Mary brought it home, having been given it. And so me and Mary were playing with it and we cut all her hair off. And um, then the next day in school, the friend said to Mary, oh, I've only lent you that doll. I want it back. <laughs> so, um, Mary came home distraught, because Mary was never one for breaking the rules, were you, Mary? 
Mary came home distraught and said, oh, she wants the doll back. And Rod said, don't worry, I've got an idea. <laughs> and he had Julie, my, you know, ma'am, cut some of his curls off. <laughs> and with the boss stick, he stuck them on the Pippa doll. And so Mary took this doll back to school the next day <laughs> with Rod's hair stuck on it. And the other day, when we were discussing what we were going to say, I said to Mary, you know, what did this friend say? And Mary said, I don't know, I blocked the memory. She <laughs> said. <laughs> yeah, so just uh, following on what um, Mary said, you know, we had a brilliant childhood, didn't we? Always doing something silly and, um, you know, out and about of fun, and Rod always had fun. And all our friends would come over the house, and he would always welcome them, anyone would come in and he'd always make them a sandwich. He probably wouldn't want all this for us today, but um, he'd probably want to make you all a sandwich and then have a nice walk. So thank you for all coming. Painting a, a wonderful picture of life in the Morgan household. I'd love to have been there on some of those occasions. Rodri's cousin, Nia, Nia Powell, has written um, a poem about Rodri, which she is now going to read. Thank you, Nia. Oedd Rodri yn arwr i fi ys pam o'n i'n blentyn, o'n i'n byw yn yr un pentra, ac oedd i bob amser yn antur i fynd i lawr i tyla'r teg. Llyr o'r pris a'r Rhodri yn byw. Rhodri was my hero from early childhood. We lived in the same village, and going down to Tlateg was always an adventure, including going to the jungle there. Um, Uncle TJ, uh, Rhodri's father, was a great gardener, and grew tomatoes uh, of various colours, um, I'd never seen orange and yellow tomatoes ever. I got crudro hwn yn cael higion yn maen union fel mynd i'r jyngl yno. Ac yng nghanol hyn i gyd, roedd pris ar hodri yn ei harddega ac oedd yn dwi'n arwyr i fi ac yn arwyr wedi hynny hefyd. Ond mae hwn i'r hodri. Rhoi'r gŵr fyn ar o'r gwerin. A rhoi'r tân, rhoi sy'r tu hwn rhyddyn. Rhoi'r glatgar feiddgar i fi'n. Rhoi i hyno y brenin. Thank you, Nia. Now, Sally Tarleton, um, who is one of our pianists today, um, was actually Rodri's piano teacher, and she was teaching him to play Take the A Train. Sally is now going to play that for us, and later in the programme, Jane Hutt uh, will be telling us about his piano lessons and how well he was progressing. But for now, it's over to Sally.
Wonderful. I could just see Rodri playing that. Memories of a friend now. Kevin Brennan succeeded Rodri as MP for Cardiff West and is going to share with us some of his memories of his friend. Rodri Morgan was the uh, most extraordinary person I've ever known, and I was extremely fortunate to have been his advisor through the intense political years between 1995 and 2000, as well as being a friend of his for 30 years. In that era of political spin, there were some who couldn't quite comprehend how a politician as free-range and organic as Rodri could have the kind of political reach with voters that well-groomed, perfectly packaged politicians could only dream of. And Rodri really did have that kind of reach. He could knock on any door, almost anywhere in Wales, and be recognized. The only question was if those he met would express delight and amazement at a visit from the First Minister or simply say, hello, Rodri, and invite him in for a cup of tea as if he was a long-standing friend or a long-lost uncle. And many years before he became uh, First Minister of Wales, we went together to a one-day cricket cup tie at Sophia Gardens. And we had a couple of tickets in the cheap seats. And at the time, there was a BBC Wales campaign, I don't know if anybody can remember it, uh, in support of the team, which had the chant, we love Glamorgan Morgan, we love Glamorgan Morgan. And uh, it had been adopted by the fans. And as we went to take our seats, the crowded stand all stood up and started chanting, we love that Rodri Morgan, we love that Rodri Morgan. <laughs> and of course, many people have, have referenced uh, his sporting obsessions, uh, particularly his interest in, in rugby and Welsh athletics. In fact, the last time I saw him with Julie, the Saturday before he passed away, he leaned over during a break in the scintillating Indian dance performance we were attending at the National Museum to ask me to look up the score in the European Rugby Cup final uh, on my phone. Uh, and famously, uh, many years ago at the Hay Festival, uh, the late great poet Danny Absey was remembering the Cardiff City lineup of his youth, uh, but he couldn't remember the final name, and a voice from the back of the audience helped him out. And of course, uh, it was Rodri uh, telling him who the player he couldn't remember was. Uh, but of course, uh, our friendship was at root a political one, and it was events before and after the 1997 general election that forged Rodri's place in Welsh history. And I have to be frank, he was blunt and quite mildly profane when he rang me up to tell me that Tony Blair had not appointed him uh, to the government after the years he'd put in on the shadow Welsh Affairs team preparing for devolution before 1997. But as Julie said last week, Rodri never dwelt on things for long. He didn't look back in anger. It amused me when uh, he was first minister that he liked to take visitors out on the balcony upstairs next to his office in the other building to show them all the things he had unsuccessfully opposed. Uh, <laughs> like, like the barrage out here. Uh, or this building, actually, initially, which he used to call originally the Lean Two. Uh, but he got to love it later on uh, when he was First Minister for a while. But he never wasted time brooding on a setback. He embraced every setback as an opportunity. And in 1997, he quickly decided that he would stand for the Assembly and for the Welsh Labour leadership. And I think he understood more than anyone that devolution would change everything and that it would fail, and that Labour in Wales would fail if it was believed to be a branch office of Labour HQ in London. In a real sense, that was the moment that Welsh Labour was born. He saw the real potential of devolution before anyone else. Even when intense pressure came on him to stand down, he was determined that there should be a contest. And I remember being told in that first contest that the Secretary of State would not have time to do any debates uh, with Rodri. And I explained that this was not wise, because two or three set-piece debates were all that was needed. 
But otherwise, Rodri would get himself invited to every Labour Party branch in every little village in Wales. He'd drive himself there. He'd know half the people in the room. The other half would be related to him. He'd, he'd drink a swift half, he'd eat fish and chips, and he'd enjoy himself immensely. And of course, that's exactly how it proved. And of course, the rules in that contest didn't allow for a fully democratic vote, but there was no doubt who the people of Wales really wanted. And there was, of course, a second contest, but again, the stops were pulled out from the top to thwart him. But if Rodri was anything, he was determined. And actually, he was stubborn. He believed passionately that he was the right person to make success of Welsh devolution. And he knew that for Wales to embrace devolution, the leader would not just have to be from Wales, but would have to be seen to be made in Wales. Uh, it was another setback, that second contest, but typically he threw himself loyally into his work as an assembly minister. And when he got the top job eventually, I was his special advisor, and our first visit was to Ireland with Paul Murphy, who's going to be speaking later. The Irish loved him because he was loquacious, he was learned, he was witty, and as my Irish father would say, he could talk the hind legs off a donkey. And it made me think that perhaps the real reason the London establishment never took to Rodri was that they didn't really understand his very Celtic way of communicating. It was a slightly circular way sometimes of communicating. They seemed to think he was joking when he was serious and that he was serious when he was joking. Like, like when the London media reported it absolutely straight when he said he enjoyed being driven round in the First Minister's car with the number plate TAF1 on the front. Uh, the, Irish, the Irish got his enjoyment of the playful art of seemingly pointless but actually deeply illuminating conversation in a way that the efficient functionary, functionaries of the metropolitan establishment never could. Many people have spoken about uh, how in later years Rodri randomly gifted them produce from his garden. And one woman uh, said rather memorably to me last week, he honored me with his rhubarb. <laughs> and in a way, that's how I feel about the many hours of meandering conversation that he and I uh, had in the office or in the pub or at the rugby or on long car journeys or a party conference or down at the Riverside Market. He honored me uh, with his rhubarb. He honored all of us uh, with his rhubarb. It was a privilege to converse with someone so genuinely interested in everyone and everything and for whom conversation was an art to be explored and enjoyed and for whom the most painful pun like his famous one, Last Quango in Powys, uh, was a treasure to be celebrated, like the finest poetry. Not that there was anything shallow uh, in Rodri's cultural life. He enjoyed art, music, and poetry, as, as he loved politics and he loved sport. And ironically, words cannot adequately, adequately encapsulate this remarkable Welshman, this everyman, this sometimes somewhat disheveled figure, with his unique, unruly hair, who treated everyone equally, who loved people of all races and backgrounds, particularly his Cardiff West constituents, who loved life, who loved his family, particularly his grandchildren, who loved nature, loved to grow things in the soil, loved to swim with dolphins in Cardigan Bay. No words can adequately capture him, but when I thought of Rodri and his sudden passing and of the mortality that we all share with him, uh, these words of the great American poet of democracy who Rodri loved, Walt Whitman, came to mind. A child said, what is the grass, fetching it to me with full hands? How could I answer the child? I do not know what it is any more than he. I guess it must be the flag of my disposition out of hopeful green stuff woven. Or I guess it is the handkerchief of the Lord a scented gift and remembrancer designedly dropped, bearing the owner's name some way in the corners that we may see and remark and say whose. Or I guess the grass is itself a child, the produced babe of the vegetation. Or I guess it is a uniform hieroglyphic, and it means sprouting alike in broad zones and narrow zones, 
growing among black folks as among white, Canuck, Tuckahoe, Congressman, Cuff. I give them the same. I receive them the same. And now, it seems to me, the beautiful uncut hair of graves. Thank you, Rodri, for honoring us all with the gift of your friendship and company and with the legacy of your life and leadership. Dioch. Thank you so much, Kevin, for that wonderful, heartfelt tribute to Rodri, to your friend. It gives me great pleasure now um, to invite, I'm tempted to say, the current First Minister, Carwyn Jones, to read the poem that he has chosen, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. Thank you, Carwyn. The poem that I'm about to read was written by Dylan Thomas uh, to express his feelings at the loss of his father. Rodri has been called on many occasions over the past week the father of devolution, uh, the father of our nation. And as we remember fondly, as we have done today, uh, many of the aspects of his character, there is a sense of loss, of course, a loss to the family, but a loss to us all. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Though wise men at their end no dark is right, because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learn too late, they grieved it on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death, who see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Those immortal words. Well, 1987 was a great Welsh Labour. MP, Minister of State for Northern Ireland and Secretary of State for Wales, and I know a great friend of Rodri's. Paul, I'd like to invite you now to share some of your memories of those times. Thank you. Uh, Rodri honoured me with tomatoes, uh, <laughs> as well as rhubarb, and I was greatly um, pleased by that. But he also honoured me, of course, for almost 40 years with his friendship. And uh, Lorraine mentioned the 1987 general election. And uh, before that election, the late, mid-late 1980s, um, Alan Michael, Paul Flynn, Wynne Griffith, Salim Williams, Carmarthen, Rodri and myself uh, were known as the M4 group of prospective parliamentary candidates. It was stretched in the geographical imagination for Torvine to be actually called an M4 constituency, but when Rodri phoned me up and asked me to join this esteemed group, I think somewhere in about 19, late 1985, 1986, I was pleased to do so. And then two years later, in 1987, when we actually won the general election in our constituencies, 
we all went to the House of Commons on the very same day, and we all caught the train on the very same day, sang the red flag on Cardiff Station and on Newport Station, because I joined, of course, at Newport, and entered the House of Commons together as a group. Ray Powell, who was then the whip in the House of Commons, a great Welsh MP, of course, um, gave us hugely preferential treatment, put us all in the same office in Old Palace Yard, and there we stayed together for almost five years. And we learnt by lots of mistakes, some successes, and became collectively great friends. Um, our desks weren't exactly all the same. You can imagine Rodri's was a little chaotic and uh, full of papers, but it was a great experience. And we laughed and we joked and we gossiped and we enjoyed ourselves for those five years. And in those five years, uh, Rodri became a very skillful and adept parliamentarian. He took the skills that he learned in the House of Commons, of course, later here in this assembly. Of course, we are overlooking Cardiff Bay, and some of you will recall the great debates that went on about the Cardiff Bay Barrage Bill, the private bill that uh, was actually stopped for a short time by the parliamentary tactics of Rodri, which included going through the entire night imitating birdsong in the House of Commons. I think it was the first and probably the last time that that will ever happen, but it worked. Um, I was on the front bench at the time, and because the Labour Party was split, my boss, who was Barry Jones at the time, told me to say absolutely nothing for 12 hours, which I did, but it was a fascinating listen and to the bird song which Rodri, amongst other people, contributed. Uh, then some years later, he and I uh, became jointly uh, Welsh office, shadow Welsh office ministers. And it was in, in those days, those years, when we went around Wales together, um, that I really encountered this encyclopedic, brilliant knowledge about Wales. Every, he knew everyone, he knew everywhere in Wales. We'd, go on a journey from North to South Wales and every single hamlet, every single town or village we went through, he'd know somebody in it and he was something about the history of the town. And uh, he of course was a, he was a true Welsh patriot and he took great pride in his nonconformist and his radical heritage, descended as he was from Morgan Morgan, leader of the Rebecca riots in West Wales in the 19th century. And it really was no surprise to me uh, that uh, he chose eventually to become a member of this assembly and after, shall we say, a rather bumpy ride, he became the perfect fit for the job of First Minister for Wales. And although no one can doubt that he was a deep and committed socialist, he was a natural leader for all the members of our history and politics. He is about being the father of devolution and absolutely true. In 1999, uh, I was appointed the Secretary of State for Wales. He was by then, of course, um, or he was to be in some weeks, the First Minister, a role um, which he held, as of course you know, for a decade. And on the two occasions when I was Welsh Secretary, and the five years that, that those periods encompassed, I worked very closely with Rodri. We'd meet every week, without exception, in his office, and we talk every day, without exception, on the phone. And he made the job of steering devolution in his early days into what is now the accepted uh, landscape of Wales, political landscape of Wales, because of the way he actually did the job. And in terms of relationship with the British government, which I represented, I think that it was the fact that we got on so well that we did diffuse potential rows and, rows and bothers that could have occurred over those years. And on the 25th anniversary of my being a member of parliament, he came to my constituency, he came to Blaenavon, and very kindly talked um, about our relationship, which he called wonderful. And that generosity of saying that was completely typical of Rodri and I was flattered and I was moved uh, by those references. 
but of course he was himself a wonderful man. He was a Renaissance man, educated, as Priest has said, at Oxford and Harvard. He had a brilliant mind, a vivid imagination, an enviable memory, and an outstanding intellect. And as has already been said, there wasn't a subject in the world he couldn't talk about. Sport, politics, economics, the list was endless. And such an intellectual giant could easily have become an arrogant and self-important man. And he was the very opposite of that, complete opposite of it. Um, his wit, his humor, his total lack of side made him into one of the most popular politicians that Wales has ever known. His striking appearance, his public profile, meant that everybody, but everybody, knew Rodri in Wales. And on those occasions when he and I went to international rugby matches, he as First Minister and me as Secretary of State, um, first of all, he was extremely generous to me. I knew virtually nothing about rugby. Um, I should have done as a Pontypool boy, but I didn't. And in these international matches, his thoughtfulness was such that even though he was such an outstanding uh, aficionado of rugby, he would take the time every three minutes to tell me what was going on on the rugby field. <laughs> and then afterwards, we'd walk out to the stadium into uh, the streets of Cardiff, and it was an amazing spectacle. Everybody talking to him. Hi, Rod, how's it going? Hello, Rod, we were... And most of the time, he tended to know the people who said those things to him in the first place. But it was, a, it was an amazing, an amazing situation. Um, he would talk to a head of state in the same way that he would talk to the humblest of constituents in Cardiff West. And that is a feature, frankly, so rare and indeed unknown amongst politicians. He was personally thoughtful and generous to everybody who claimed his friendship. He was very kind to me all through my life, um, and he was very kind to my father, especially when my father died. They were great friends, and one of my warmest recollections was when Dad and I visited Julie and Rodri in their caravan at Munt. And uh, we went out for a walk in the early evening uh, to the coastline. And suddenly, Rodri decided to uh, summon the seals in a way that only Rodri could do, uh, which was um, a great surprise to my father, who said, what, are you, what on earth are you doing, Rodri? He said, I'm calling the seals. So what else do you think I'm doing? And it was that sort of unexpected nature of uh, Rodri's personality uh, and lifestyle that made him so admirable. Like all of us this morning, and I will certainly miss him terribly. Not so much, of course, as Julie and the family will miss him. And Julie, your marriage with him was a successful, a successful and famous political union, um, which was a, a great model for all of us in the labor movement and beyond. And our minds today are full of different memories. To me, Carwin, you and I and Rodri on a tiny plane going across Wales at the time of the foot and mouth uh, outbreak. Also, as a young MP with Rodri, day in, day out, laughing, gossiping, working out the politics in the House of Commons, and campaigning all over Wales in all sorts of weather, knocking on doors, everybody recognizing him. All these memories, each of us will think of them uh, today. Rodri was one of the most memorable, funny, compassionate, likable, and intelligent people in modern British politics. He enriched all our lives, and may he rest in peace. Thank you, Paul, for taking us back to those heady days of 1987 in particular. Well, a bit of singing now, um, and I think to reflect Rodri's love of Welsh rugby. 
We're all going to sing Cum Rhondda in English. If some of you do break it out into Welsh, that's fine. Just do what you feel is right. The words are on the um, back of the order of service card. So Sally is going to accompany us. And if I could, for those able to, could I ask you to stand, please, to sing Cum Rhondda? <clears throat> Please take your seats. Well, I'm sure that rendition has put us in the mood for some sports stories. Carolyn Hitt is one of our foremost sports writers and broadcasters, and she's a trustee of the Welsh Sports Hall of Fame, of which Rodri was chair. And Carolyn is now going to speak on behalf of the sports world in Wales that has lost a true champion. Thank you, Carolyn. It's a privilege to pay tribute to Rodri. I hope I can do him justice as beautifully as everybody else has done. And he honoured me with runner beans. <laughs> <laughs> to say that Rodri loved sport is like saying Picasso liked to pick up a paintbrush. For Rodri, sport was an all-consuming passion, backed up by encyclopedic knowledge. As such, he was the perfect chairman of the Welsh Sports Hall of Fame. Because quite simply, Rodri was Google in human form. <laughs> Whatever question we asked on any sport, he had the answer. The facts, the figures, the personal best, the scores, the dates, the names, and most of all, the wonderful anecdotes. His enthusiasm spanned sport in all its forms, from the achievements of Welsh Olympians to the matches his grandchildren played on the rugby pitch he'd made for them in the garden. And he flew the flag for Welsh sport across the world, helping to bring the Ryder Cup to Wales and putting sport in success at the core of Welsh identity. And sport was at the heart of my own friendship with Rodri. I first met him 16 years ago to interview him for a radio series on rugby. We hit it off immediately and worked on many subsequent projects together. I cherish the memories of long car journeys across Wales, sustained by the pack lunches he'd made for us listening to his astounding expertise and learning more than I thought it was possible to know about Welsh and Cardiff rugby in the 1950s. I loved the way sport informed his thinking. 
And he'd had his own moments of glory, of course, as a teenage table tennis player in the Cardiff and District League, and as we'd heard, as a distance runner in his adulthood, who was still breaking the hour for 10 miles, age 39. But it was Rodri's passion for more elite feats that coloured his politics. Indeed, that famous line that we love so much, the one that floored Jeremy Paxman, does a one-legged duck swim in, swim in circles, was actually a rugby quote. As Rodri revealed, he'd pinched it from a Cardiff prop forward who used it when asked was he pleased to get his first Welsh cap. And when Rodri made it finally to First Minister, the rugby imagery returned as he kicked off with, my first act in the Welsh jersey with a captain's armband is to reappoint the cabinet. I once saw him in a literal rather than metaphorical Welsh jersey, mingling with the fans in Sydney Harbour during the World Cup in Australia in 2003. Now we all know Rodri wasn't that fussed about sartorial elegance, but God, I'd never seen such a battered and boil-washed old Welsh shirt as he was wearing that day. But it was great because that shirt was also the mark of the true fan. It told its own stories. It looked like it had accompanied him to every match he'd ever seen. And with his seven decade record of spectating, spectating that's a lot of games. Though I don't, don't doubt that Rodri would have been able to recount every single one, complete with date score and the name of the man of the match. I loved hearing his stories about how he'd grown up loving the game. His very first rugby experience was as a seven-year-old, taken by his father to watch Cardiff in 1946. He spoke lovingly of the part sport played in their father-son relationship, how they bonded over their shared obsession with the brilliance of the great Welsh centre, Bledon Williams. And a few years later, around the age of 12, Rodney was thrilled to discuss in the previous day's Wales-England International as they streamed out of chapel in Gwela de Garth. As he told me, at one point, there must have been 30 of us in a circle, all men apart from me. I was in seventh heaven being admitted into this adult circle, and the excitement of going over every move in that game, how well we'd done, how we were going to walk it for the triple crown and so on, it was a fantastic memory. But Rodri wasn't just interested in the golden sporting recollections of his youth. He followed every facet of the modern game. I'll never forget how the morning after that soul-destroying red card that saw Wales ejected effectively, uh, from the Rugby World Cup in 2011, within touching distance of reaching the final. And he sent me a, an email of about 1,500 words. I think he wanted to share his trauma with someone who also knew the devastation that uh, we had just missed out the greatest chance in Welsh rugby history. And in this email, he outlined with forensic precision his view of Sam Warburton's tip-tip tackle on the French wing. It was not a move of malicious intent, Rodri concluded, but of simple physics the inevitable result when two players of such differing body weights collided. I love that email because it encapsulates Rodri's entire approach to sport, the attention to detail, the patriotic passion, and the empathy for the sports people involved. We saw all these qualities just a few days before Rodri's sudden passing as he hosted our Welsh Sports Hall of Fame dinner. As a board, we are grateful that our final memory of, our final memory of Rodri is seeing him that night in his element, full of joy, lauding the sporting legends around him, too modest to realise he was a true icon of Wales too. And I'm sure he would have loved the fact that as we've come together today to honour and celebrate such a remarkable life, we do so within sight of a floating football pitch. So Welsh sport has lost its biggest fan, and we have lost a dear friend. So will we miss you hugely, Rodri? as a one-legged duck swim in circles. Thank you, Carolyn, for filling in the slot to cover sport. And I'm sure you could have gone on for another hour. Well, the Hennessys are legendary, in Wales anyway and maybe a little beyond. Um, and we're so fortunate that two of them, Dave Burns and Frank Hennessy, are here to sing for us today. They've been such great friends of Rodri's and over the years have entertained many of us at Labour Party Conference Welsh Night. They were going to sing Cardiff Born, Cardiff Bred, but when we listened to the song again, decided in these enlightened times, 
some of the verses perhaps um, weren't quite suitable for today. So they've decided to sing something else. In fact, they're going to be singing two songs, and I hope telling us just a little about each song that they're going to sing. So Frank and Dave, if I could invite you to take your places. Thank you very much. We were fortunate indeed to, uh, very lucky in fact, to have Rodri uh, as a fan. And it goes back an awfully long way. I remember him uh, writing in a pamphlet, I think they called it in those days, half and half a city. What a twang that's got, isn't it? Eh? That uh, he used to attend meetings, political meetings of course, upstairs in a pub in the heart of Cardiff called the Old Arcade. And come 10 o'clock, he used to start getting twitchy because coming up through the floorboards below were the Hennessy's getting into their full stride. And all he wanted was the speaker to shut up so he could go downstairs, get a couple of pints before they closed, and join in a few of the songs. He was an amazing guy. He allowed time and space for so many different things. This is a song I wrote... Uh, on the occasion of Cardiff being a uh, hundred years a city and half century as being the, the capital of Wales. And when I'd finished writing it, I realised I'd written a love song. I'm sure Rodri identified with a couple of the verses in his song. Oh, boys, take me back. Home is where I want to be. Sing me a song of days gone by Tell me the tale of the century Oh, boys, take me back Remind me of so many charms Once again I long to lie In Cardiff's loving arms For you are always beautiful In your own way through the hard times and the wild years Before they tamed old Tiger Bay And the rhythm of the world rang out On your exotic drum I loved you long before you were The beauty you'd become Like I used to when I just got paid I could meet my old friends there Have a pint in the old arcade If they were home we'd catch a game Blue and black so hard to beat In the club, out for grub Chips on Caroline Street For you were always beautiful your own way Through the hard times and the wild years Before they tamed old Tiger Bay And the rhythm of the world rang out On your exotic drum Oh, I loved you long before you were The beauty you'd become Counting creatures on the animal wall Watching women in their fur coats Going dancing at the city hall Now oh, here you are, all grown up Sophisticated and a bit highbrow Comes as no surprise to me Everybody wants you now But you are always beautiful Your own way the hard times and the 
years Before they chained old Tiger Bay And the rhythm of the world rang out On your exotic drum Oh, I loved you long before you were The beauty you'd become And the rhythm of the world rang out On your exotic drum I loved you long before you We'd uh, like to sing you a song now in Welsh, and this was the first song we ever learned to sing in Welsh. Um, we, when we first went professional, which meant we got the sack from our jobs <laughs> for being out every night playing music. So we uh, we ended up we went to live in Ireland, and we lived in a tent for three months, and then it uh, got a bit cold around November, so we moved into a caravan. And we lived on a caravan site in Ireland for about six months. Uh, but our caravan became so untidy that gypsies reported us to the council. <laughs> so we came back. But while we were in the caravan, uh, we learned this song, which was uh, a song we'd heard sung in... Uh, we were locked into a pub at the bottom of St. Mary Street okay. once. Uh, the old, I think it was the Blue Anchor. And uh, we'd heard an old Welsh navvy singing this song, and we loved it so much, we sent from Ireland, we sent for the words, and uh, the words were sent to us, and we learned it. And we've sung it, I think, every, every concert since. It's a beautiful song. Uh, it's basically a love song about a young man singing of his true love who lives on the seashore, Arlan Amor.
Thank you, Frank and Dave. That was just so special. I cannot find the words. We're just so grateful to you for playing for us today. Well, our next speaker almost needs no introduction. He's been a regular visitor to the Welsh Assembly since its inception in 1999. In fact, he's part of the furniture. He's an ardent supporter of devolution and has led many vigils on the steps of the Senedd, bringing people together when there's been a natural disaster or a terrorist atrocity in the UK or even around the world. We've all gathered with him on the steps outside. Alid Edwards is a, a friend to many, and I would now like to invite him forward to pay his tribute to Rodri. Thank you, Alid. Thank you, Lorraine. Friends, journey with me today, not to places of darkness, sadness, or grief, but to places of wonder, places in a nation's recent history that are made of many colours. Courageously, 15 years ago, Rotary's team enabled the setting up of a pioneering refugee doctor's training scheme. 87 GMC registered doctors later. The current cohort met recently in a small room not far from here. Those of us who were there marveled at something that happened. The doctors came from dark and troubled places and told us of their hopes. They also told us of their painful stories. The tortured darkness of our world visited Wales. Because we cared, we cried a little. As tears were shed, the sun broke through the clouds above Cardiff Bay. Gentle and soft rain began to fall, and the rich colours of a rainbow pierced through the window and filled the room. Friends from many nations gasped and marvelled. I remember where I was when the darkness of 9-11 fell. Many of us do. I remember looking at the TV screen through a shop window in Wrexham as the Twin Towers fell, knowing that our world would not be the same again. Our world shed tears that day too. Within days, Roddy had gathered Wales's faith communities together. We gathered the rich colours of our different traditions, exchanged phone numbers, and became close friends. Out of the darkness, a rainbow of faith formed. Since then, the darkness has fallen many times. The darkness that is terrorism has many shades. All its shades are dark. So we now gather as a country of many colours, of faith to defy the darkness by the audacity of the rich shades of our many friendships. My final place of blending of colours is deeply personal. Out of the different darkness of the abuse of children, Wales moved to appoint a children's commissioner. Peter Clark was commissioned to protect children. I, at the time, had been commissioned to protect those who might suffer discrimination on the grounds of race. Both of us struggled with the shades of darkness. A working relationship became something a great deal deeper, and I'm deeply grateful for it. Peter's life was cut short by illness. As life drew to a close in a small hospital room, we shared thoughts about what had been achieved in lifetimes shaped by values and beliefs. A ray of light broke through and we gathered thoughts from belief and from imagination about the lights and shapes we sometimes see as life ends. We took comfort 
in what some call the cloud of witnesses. Those who have shaped our lives in the past, affirming us kindly in what we have become. Those around us now, affirming us graciously in what we are. And those who will be blessed by what we've achieved, celebrating from our futures. Without ever being aware of it, Rodri had that great gift of making all of us who worked around him become a little more than what we used to be. Being a little more than what we used to be, we gathered to remember him in this Senedd just a few days ago. That night on the Senedd steps, we gathered our many colours once again to honour the victims of Manchester. Our vigil was enriched by the gracious sounds of children playing. As we held a sacred silence in memory, a blessing for Hodri came to mind. I offer it to you. Blessed during dark and turbulent days are the harbingers of rainbows, for they alone will make nations. Dewch wi gwmwl tystion. Dewch o'r canrifoedd a fi yn gewri ysgogwyr a gwerin li. Gwelwch rhyfeddod ag eir yma, nid marwnad. Dewch wi gwmwl tystion an wyliad diweddar yr ia dros Gymru rai. Gysodwch ddeiradau'r galon a gwaith eich dwylo yn flodeiger yma. Bydalw nina ein tyrnged, ni y breintiedig rai. Dewch wi genedlaethau i'r dyfodol, dewch â'ch synnau amryliw i'n senedd. Gosodwch eich gobeithion y man glyd. Dewch chi gymwl tystion, gwelwch fawredd rhodd yr chodri hwn. Gwelwch Gwelwch yma, rhyfeddod, cadernid ein cenedl ni. Nid colled mor awr hon. Diolch. Thank you, Aled, again for those uh, wonderful memories and I know very personal thoughts and a personal tribute to Rodri. Nkosi Sikaleli was sung throughout the apartheid era as the anthem of a free South Africa and Rodri was an active member of the Wales anti-apartheid movement. He was also instrumental in setting up the Wales for Africa programme which included the Life for African Mothers charity of which Julie is a trustee. So, to celebrate those years and also to celebrate the success of that programme of which Rodri was so proud, I'd like to invite Kurkochin Kaidiv to sing Nkosi Sikaleli. And they have said to me, if anyone here remembers the words and wants to sing along, you're more than welcome. Thank you very much.
thank, thank you so much, Kolkoki and Kaidi, for taking so many of us here back to those anti-apartheid days. And I hope you don't mind if I just say that someone else would have been here today had he not sadly died not that long ago. Ray would have been here with his red beret leading you all. Um, so thank you all so much for that wonderful rendition. There are many, everyone here today was a friend of Rodri's. There are many who have been friends of Rodri's and Julie's for many years. And someone who has been a very close friend is Jane Hutt. And she's now going to pay her tribute to her friend. Rodri was my friend, my leader as first minister, and he was also a uniquely cherished constituent in the Vale of Glamorgan. So Rodri always found time to campaign with me, but he also loved his local walks. He enjoyed swimming in the sea with Juliet Whitmore Bay, nothing to compare with Munt, of course, and he enjoyed uh, his flourishing garden with family and friends. So very recently, we enjoyed a special Stuart Spanish omelette, some of you will know what that means, made with eggs from his latest batch of chickens bought at Riverside Market. Those were accompanied by lettuce and radishes from the garden with a table laid by his grandson, Jaden. Well, Roger was so proud of all his children and grandchildren have been wonderful in their tributes, their poems and their singing today. And I was very pleased to meet Jaden with Rodri at Dinas Powys Primary School very recently on Fair Trade Day. Jaden is a member of the school's eco-committee. He was holding up a very large Fair Trade banana for photos with Rodri, me and his friends. And it is great to remember that it was under Rodri's watch as First Minister that Wales was declared the world's first fair trade nation in 2008. Julie spoke last week of Rodri's retirement and how much he enjoyed new projects and learning new skills. He was already a skilled woodcarver, but as we heard earlier, Rodri was also learning the piano and enjoying playing some jazz. Take the A Train was one of his favourite new pieces. So Sally was his piano teacher. She actually gave me a report on his progress, and it goes like this. Rodri was a very keen and interested pupil and practised diligently every week. <laughs> now, I so, I'm sure that there's many pupils and parents who would like to read that in their reports. But Sally also received an email. We've talked about texts and emails that people have received today. Sally received an email on the 17th of May uh, from Rodri, and we want to share this with you, thinking of him particularly on that day. And this email read to Sally, you won't believe this, but I was waiting for my two American friends at the Eurostar at St Pancras, and the train was an hour late. I did avail myself of the public piano <laughs> and gave it a little tickle without anyone pouring cold water or hot coffee over me. <laughs> on Tuesday, the 23rd of May, we gave our tributes to Rodri here in the Senate. And we were reminded, as Lorraine has said, that Rodri was a founder member of the Wales anti-apartheid movement and that Rodri, alongside Julie, was always there in that campaign and played his part in Wales in bringing the evil of apartheid to an end. And being close friends with Rodri and Julie with shared political commitments led us to working together in many different ways over the years like the time that we secured European funding when I was a councillor and he was head of the European office in Wales. And that funding was for a training workshop that has benefited thousands of women and children over the past three decades. We all worked together on the Yes for Wales campaign, which took us both into the assembly and into government as ministerial colleagues. And within a year, he was first minister. Carwin said in his Senate tribute, last week we lost one of nation's giants, one of our nation's giants. He may be gone, but his name is written into our history. He went on to say, Rodri was somebody who commanded great respect, but for him there was no ceremony, no airs and graces. What I am now as a politician, I owe to him. And so many have shared this view in their tributes. 
He was both a formidable leader and first minister, making tough decisions, engaging with world leaders, whilst also showing interest and respect for everyone he met in his daily life. His impact on devolution for Wales, as has been said today, was profound. Another Assembly tribute last week. When Rodri stepped down as First Minister, devolution was constitutionally embedded. And another tribute. Rodri was a man who led his country with passion and realism. And how true those of us who were his ministers, and many are here today, were supported and encouraged to get on with governing. We experienced that leadership. He ensured we were always looking to the long term, to his and our big policy ideas which could move Wales forward. He ensured we got the legislation to appoint the first Children's Commissioner for Wales in 2001. Voices from care knew they could trust him. He was passionate about the health service, supporting primary care, but also championing medical research, appointing the first chief scientific advisers for Wales. He had a clear health agenda. That's why we brought in free prescriptions, the first country in the UK to do so. He recognised the Tudor Hart inverse care law and invested in a health inequalities fund to tackle heart disease. The design in Wales badge was key to his approach. He knew that our public services had to be shaped to meet people's needs and be based on cooperation, not competition. His contribution to education has been distinctive, recognising the importance of investing in the early years, backing the foundation phase. He was proud to open the prestigious Swansea Graduate Medical School and publicly fund the 21st Century Schools Building Programme. Rodri championed Wales, but he was also a leader who looked out to the wider world. The Wales for Africa programme, which has already been mentioned, is a shining example of that. And Africa Day was celebrated in the Senate last week. The Red Choir has brought his love of Africa to this, this celebration today. So we've come together, friends, family, today to celebrate the life of Rodri Morgan to share our memories with Julie and his family, who also shared his life with us. And remember what Julie said last week, he never looked back, he made his decisions and he never regretted them. He had a wonderful life and he enjoyed every minute. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share our great memories, to sing and play the music he enjoyed, to hear his stories and to be awed by his intellect. We must, and I'm sure will, learn from Rodri's life and time. It is our job to build the secure foundations he laid for a fairer Wales. Thank you for showing the way. Our Rodri, a great friend of Wales. Diolch Rodri. Thank you, thank you, Jane, for that lovely tribute, um, very personal tribute to Rodri. I think with all the tributes we've heard today, uh, with all the, the memories that have been shared, you'll all have your own memories, your own thoughts of Rodri. So let's take a quiet moment to sit and think of him in our own way, as we knew him in life. For those who wish, please take this moment for your own private prayer. Thank you. I think the best answer to death is the wholehearted and continued affirmation of life. Rodri left many legacies in the people he came into contact with and the organizations he helped and encouraged. And these words by Terry Pratchett sum up how the influence we can have on others will live on long after we are gone. And this is very true. 
of Rodri Morgan. No one is finally dead until the ripples they cause in the world die away, until the clock he wound up winds down, until the wine she made has finished its ferment, until the crop they planted is harvested. The span of someone's life, they say, is only the core of their actual existence. We are now coming towards the close of our ceremony for Rodri, but I hope peace, strength, love and understanding will grow from the sorrow and the joy we have shared today so that our lives are enriched along with the lives of those who follow. On behalf of Julie and her family, I would like to thank everyone who has made today possible. I would like to thank you, Llawydd, for allowing us to hold this celebration of Rodri's life here in the Senedd at the heart of Welsh democracy. And please pass on our thanks to Commission staff who have given everything to make today happen. They have given up so much of their own time. Thank you to all the participants, our two pianists, Trevor and Sally, who have made today special, and all of you have helped us really reflect who Rodri was. I know Julie and the family are just so grateful to all of you. Many of you will know that donations given in Rodri's memory will go into a fund to be shared between local charities that he supported. And there's a Just Giving page, Rodri Morgan Wales, what else would it be? Now, a few years ago, I did a fundraising event with Rodri, loosely based on Desert Island Discs for copy copyright reasons. It couldn't be called Desert Island Discs. And he had to choose, I asked him to choose seven records, but he said, I can only choose eight. He said, there's one, I can't lose one of them. They all mean something to me. So I said, okay you can have eight records that you would take on your desert island. The last song he chose was really the anthem of the Labour Party and the trade union movement. It's a song that his family then said to me he would sing around the house all the time. Joe Hill was a great union organiser and poet and was executed in 1915 on what is universally accepted to have been a trumped-up charge. And Joe Hill became a folk hero for workers around the world. The version Rodri chose for his desert island was sung by Paul Robeson. But today I feel we are very privileged to have Dave Burns sing it for us and for Rodri. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. I sang this once at uh, a retirement party for Di Francis when he retired from the National Union of Mine Workers. And I asked him afterwards, I said, did you enjoy that song, Di? And he said, I've heard it sung better. <laughs> but. He went on to explain that he'd heard uh, Paul Robeson singing it in the Capitol Cinema, uh, accompanied by the Triarchy Male Voice Choir. So he said, you're not a bad second. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night Alive as you and me Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead I never died, said he I never died, said he In Salt Lake City, Joe, says I him standing by my side 
They framed you on a murder charge Says Joe, I never die Says Joe, I never die Oh, the copper bosses shot you, Joe They failed you full of lead Takes more than guns to kill a man Says Joe, and I ain't dead Says Joe, and I ain't dead I'm standing there as big as life Him smiling with his eyes Says he what they forgot to kill Went on to organize Went on to organize From San Diego up to Maine In every mine and mill Where working men defend their rights It's there you'll find your there you'll find Joe Hill Joe Hill ain't dead he says to me Joe Hill ain't never died where workers strike and organize Joe Hill is by their side Joe Hill is by their side I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night Alive as you and me Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead I never died, said he I never died, said he Thank you, Dave. That was so very, very special. In a moment, we'll be bringing our ceremony for Rodri, our celebration of his life, to a close. We'll be singing the Welsh anthem, My Hain Lad Van Hadai, after which Julie and the close family members will accompany Rodri out of the Senedd to the hearse. Please remain standing after the anthem and please remain in the Senedd. Uh, there will be some light refreshments available upstairs and Julie and the family will be coming back in then to join us. So for those able to, would you please stand for the Welsh anthem? <clears throat> 